What changed from, uh, you know, doing the club so heavy, being the, the, the dude that brought all the shows and then... The game really started changing when the CDs was introduced and, you know, a lot of people, you know, I know, I know evolution is a big part of life in general. And when that was introduced from DJing, I kind of like, you know, I, I was getting tired with it, you know, DJing wasn't fun anymore. And I always said if it was, it was going to stop being fun, I didn't want to be a part of it. So, uh, you know, in 04, you know, I, I was really, you know, trying to get my, you know, my feet wet with the family thing, trying to get grounded. And I started to write a book. Okay. And uh, I said to myself, man, I'm never going to be able to finish this if I stay in New York. So I moved out to Orlando because my brother was out here. And um, came out here to finish writing a book, which I did. Turned it in. It just so happened at that time, uh, Carmen, Nas's baby's mom, decided to drop a book at the same time. <laughs> and they wanted sen sensationalism. And, and Random House Publishing said, you know what, uh, Mr. B Mr. Swift, uh, here's a check, <laughs> which I got paid for. And the shit, you know, just sat on the shelf. And I got 428 pages of transcript that I, I got in the vault, man. I'm not really uh, going to, you know, tell anybody. Because basically, I really outed myself and a lot of personal shit. You know, that was more like a, a, a therapy for me. Okay. Because there was a lot of self-realization at that time. You know, I ain't going to front. People who knew how to be swift back in the days. I got high. I used to drink, man. I was... Uh, I was just living life. I was partying for the moment, man. I, I was real reckless. And when I wrote that book and I started reading what I what I was doing to myself, I was like, damn, you know, like <laughs> anybody else, you would call them an asshole that, you know, they had all those opportunities. And it's not like, you know, I blew any of them, but I felt like I could have been a lot further along. Right. And because of that, got stagnant. And then, like, I just quit altogether when I moved to Florida. So... The book, no one's seen the book. A uh, few people have. I actually would post, uh, during my, my MySpace years, I would post excerpts on there. Okay. About that. But then, you know, it was a little bit too damning. And, and you know, a lot of people got offended by it because, you know, when, when, when you're writing and you're being truthful, you, you got to tell the whole story. You can't tell the police version. You know, just you tell enough just to satisfy and, and leave out all the good stuff. So, you know, when I would talk about incidents where there was a lot of chicks involved and, you know, People knew who I rolled with back in those days, and those same people that I rolled with were still with the same chicks that they were in. So, so they was like, "Yo, I, I'll never forget one of my men. I won't say his name. Was like, yo, Ed, man, I heard about the book, and you know, I, I want to know what you're writing about." Well, I said, "Well, it's not about you, my nigga. You know, like it's an Eddie B. Swift book." So he says, "Well, I know you're gonna write. You know, what, what, what are you gonna write about?" I said, well, "About things I've done in my DJ career." He says, are you going to tell anything about the girl stuff? I said, I had a lot to do with it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, okay. we partied a lot with chicks. He was like, well, Ed, I'm still with the same girl I was with back in high school. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you do write that and it does get published, she's going to be the first one to read it. So I was like, my father's like, yo, Ed, fuck that. <laughs> Put the shit out. He's like, you're putting yourself out there more than anybody. Why should he worry about that? I mean, he should have did all those things he did. Right. And, you know, I, I thought about it and I let him read it. And I said, even if I changed his name and, and call him something else and call him Scooter, <laughs> she would know because you're like, wait a minute. The day his baby's mom got shot, he was at the club and Victor was, oh, wait, I just said the name anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, man. B. Thing was with him. So, you know, I, I would have been caught out there. He would have been caught out there either way. But, you know, thankfully, you know, I think he must have. Put a little brew on me or something, man, and you know the book never came out. <laughs> Damn you! No, <laughs> um, can, can you share some of the stories that? I'll know. tell you a good one. Okay. Uh, a salsa singer who shall we name nameless, but who was married to a chick from the Bronx, uh, <laughs> was a heavy coke user. Okay. And every time I would DJ at Le Poulet, he would come down there, and, and he would always come see me. He's like, "Hey, come to the dressing room." Always have a bevy of chicks with him, you know. And, and at that time, his English salsa record had dropped. And it was a nice album, so he's really popping off. And he was making movies at that time. So he came with two of the actors. Well, he came with one actor and one TV guy. I'll say the guy from TV because he's a dick anyway. Uh, Michael DiLorenzo. Okay. And uh, Glenn Plummer. And the salsa slash ex-husband of the chick from the Bronx. But anyway... So <laughs> he um he comes out and, and he's like, yo, Ed, I want to introduce you to these people over here. So they said, Eddie B. Swift, Glenn Plummer. So he shakes my hand and I, I'm like, wow, I seen 
I seen colors, you know, that's high top, you know what I'm saying? You know, I said, I seen South Central, I'm like, wow. You know, like, I, I'm in awe now because I'm seeing Glenn Plummer. So then Michael DiLorenzo, I guess, felt like he wasn't introduced fast enough and puts out his hand, goes, Michael DiLorenzo, New York Undercover. Right. I looked at him like, for real, like, <laughs> do you want me to leak Yoba you on your neck or something? Like, come on, man. Like, that'd be Swift, DJ. Like, all right, Dick, you know, we're introduced now. Can you get out of my way? So I went back to the room and, um, you know, they, they was on some Scarface shit in there. And he closed the door and he's like, all right, everybody, before y'all to get any grandeur ideas of going to National Enquirer and telling them anything, I know who's in the room. I know who did what. We're all going to do this. So it was like everybody was going to get dirt on them that particular moment. Right. And the said person at that particular time went and proceeded to do some Scarface shit, chopped into the brick and made a fucking line. That, that, I'm sorry. It just... I was in tears when I seen him do it. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit. And he shot up. His frail body say, I'm the king. And you're like, I was like, what the fuck is wrong with this dude? Like, I said, yo, I got to get back and DJ. I, I, I kind of like made my way out. But it was amazing. I, and I told stories like that. And that's what they wanted. You know, they like shit like that. But at the end of the day, I'm glad it kind of didn't go out. Because even though I put myself out there, it was a lot of sensationalism. And a lot of people... Would have been pissed off at me and you know you already know how that goes down i feel you on that now having said that I, for me to you i would love to read it so one day I, I'll, I'll definitely like i said i post a lot of it from time to time i get into one of my moods where i'm really you know just self-therapeuting myself and and i start just posting shit on, on facebook from time to time in my notes so you know you'll, you'll see something so you gave birth to that book here in orlando yes yes i did okay that's what's up and so what years was that out here 2004 during the, the major hurricanes okay. that i've witnessed for the first time in my life was scared shitless charlie yes yes oh gosh it yeah was that bad. was bad i moved there the week of that's the one nobody took serious yeah and i, and I had no power for two weeks i took that shit very serious <laughs> but then you know like i said i came out here to quit and that didn't happen because i went right back to djing probably about two weeks later so i was like in a two-week retirement you know did the jay-z shit Gave everybody the big, all right, see you later, and came back two weeks later. You know? <laughs> well, here's what's funny about that, because when we talked a while back, we were like, yo, how did we not know you were here, and how did you not know we were here? You know, it, it's crazy, because like I said, when I came over here, I was immediately thrusted into a beef with Pro Style and Nasty. Okay. They were the, they were working together at uh, Power 95 at the time, right? and they were partnering up, and uh, 102 Jams was looking for something to put up against them. So uh, I just happened to be the flavor of the moment DJ from New York up in here. I had did a uh, taboo. Uh, Akon had just did his first show. That's when he dropped Locked Up. Uh, June Bug, all these dudes out here. So they had offered me a spot on, on 102 Jams to go directly up against them. So Pro Style did that little bitch shit and went up there to all the the club owners and said that I'm gonna pull the advertising off the radio if you hire this dude. Right. Let's just say after that I was DJing in a place like Red Square Lounge and all the small places because the bank, fucking Antigua, Cairo, uh, uh, Chillers even was like, yo, we can't, you know, any place that he played at, I was not allowed to play. Okay. So that's how that started. And then it kind of soured me. But then I, I started meeting all the underground cats. Like when we saw about 95 Live and all of that other shit. Right. Started messing with my brother, uh, my boys, Quick Night. Styles, and then you know, I met a handful of other DJs out here. But you know, uh, Riot, and, and actually, it was one of the times that me and BA started rocking together. Okay. And, and was uh, doing internet radio. Okay. And it's audio form though. All right, we did '95 live in like '02. Yes. And then after that, NSX went up. You know what I'm saying? And then um, the whole politics of the whole shit made us kind of play the back and just start to do it for ourselves instead right. of trying to make something out of it. So. But back to you. So uh, <laughs> you you wrote the book. A um, little bit shit happened. There's a history of that out here. The whole oh, yeah. crabs yeah. in a bucket mentality. You Everybody, let me tell you something. And, and I said a speech during Be Dude Up Project. And, and, and it was heartfelt because it wasn't practiced. It wasn't staged. And I've always felt that if people would just unify, you know, there's enough underground artists out here, enough underground DJs to create a movement out here. For us, um, it, it's we two ships that kind of passed in a sense. Pretty but much. then what ended up happening was through the Point Blank show, the the ten hour marathon. We, you know, what I'm saying, um, I, I'm just, you know, I'm gonna ask really for the record. I know you've already told me, but we knew um, who Eddie B. Swift was. Wow, and, thank you. And to hear, you know, what I'm saying, hey, he wants to talk to you. Um, 
was an honor, first of all. And I, honestly, we were like, what does he want to talk to us about? <laughs> and really just like, what kind of made you reach out? Well, you know, like I said, I appreciate it. Like, when, cause I, like I said, I've always been fond of, of Point Blank and Infrared. And when I saw PB was doing uh, internet radio, something that I got him back into when I was here, I was glad he was doing it. I felt it was about time. And then I watched it a couple of times when I had the chance. And, and then the show came along. So I told him, I said, look, man. On Friday, we're going to carry you guys. Stop doing Cut Cafe. Like, we're going to carry the whole 10 hours. Like, you know, I, I dig that. You know what I'm saying? That that, that, that was a great look. You know, and the, the roster was crazy. So, I think uh, you guys had started it off, if I'm not mistaken. Or first, you were the first one. Yeah. And then I think you guys followed in the next coming hours. Like, you guys were on the earlier set, if I'm not mistaken. Correct? It did, like, 2 o'clock. Right. Okay. I, I dig, like, you know, the, the, the swag and style you had. And then, you know, we were talking about Panic Vision. I went immediately to look you guys up. And I saw what you had going on. I was like, damn, you know, you know, I need that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I felt like you guys were embodying what I was, what I thought Orlando was supposed to be doing. Thank you know, you. And PB was starting to do it, you know, but I saw what you were doing on your side. I was like, that's what I'm talking about. So, you know, that made me, you know, want to, you know, work with you guys in that aspect. Like, you know, I, w like, I wish I would have met you guys a long time ago. I know we could have been in such a different place right now. And this, after, this interview would have been a thing of the past because, we probably wouldn't even did this. We'd have been so far ahead of what was going on, man. You know, it, it, but you know, everything happens for a reason. That's true, and uh, thank you for saying all that. I appreciate it. Um, so the Cut Cafe, right? When did you start doing internet radio? Me, I started doing cut, uh, internet radio in 1996. Wow. When we were making major money off of that shit, I was getting three thousand dollars a month to do eight hours of programming a week, and shit, three thousand dollars a month. The site was uh, simplyradio.com, which is still out. And uh, actually was where, uh, you know, me and B.A. started rocking together. And uh, we started doing a show called True School Radio. And B.A., uh, for a lot of people who didn't know, came up, you know, on the underground scene in New York, which was very thorough at that time. Like, you know, the same way you have the Swarms and the Ams and all of those kids, you know, that, that was that movement in New York. He was a part of that, that uh, wave. And... When he got out here and we linked up, I was like fascinated. Like, dude, how the hell did you find your way over here? And pretty much saw the same struggle that I had. And we linked up together. We just basically started putting uh, uh, our thoughts together and put together a, a radio show that it was just audio. Okay. And, you know, we, we used to get like how many hits? Oh, yeah, we had like over a million hits a month, which I thought was fascinating. A million hits a month. Then in 2008, we, uh, we started doing... The visual, because that's when we got with uh, with a uh, stream right? And uh, we really started stepping it up at that time, and we kind of like stepped away from Simply Radio and started doing True School Radio. Okay. And uh, True School Radio basically was me and BA. We just did pro like whenever we felt like getting on, we would blast it out, and you know we were doing great with the hits and so forth. But the times were changing, you know everybody was stepping up, and, and people started doing the video aspect. Right. So, you know, we started to get into that, but, you know, as with anything else, financial always plays a big part in it. And a lot of this was funded by us, right. you know, and sponsors really weren't trying to hear that. You know, like satellite radio was a premium at that time. So, you know, again, like I, I kind of like just ran out of gas out here and I was traveling, going back and forth to New York, playing out there and kind of like made my way back there behind that. Okay. And once I got back there, forget it. <laughs> I said, why the hell did I leave New York? Like. You know, it, everything was whirlwind since, but I was glad for the experience and glad for the many people that I had a chance to meet out here and still connect with to, to be put in a position where I can rock with you guys today. You know, that, that, that all those relationships were based on my time here. Everything happens for a reason, as always. So um, the Cut Cafe came out when? Cut Cafe came out last August. Not uh not this past August, the one before that. We've been okay. over a year together. And uh, Cut Cafe originally started as uh, myself, Mel Star, and uh, DJ Dummy. Okay. And then uh, eventually, we, we like had from 7 in the morning to 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Smash. Okay. Then uh, we started growing and people started coming at us. And so we started dressing around us. And then Dummy kind of like, you know, he was doing his tour and things. So kind of like you know we can't you know the morning part was starting to fall apart on the cut so you know basically it was me and mel and then 
you know, we just start Mel started putting pieces around us together, and, and basically was coming up with the lineup that we, you know, we're working with today. And then uh, over the summertime, <clears throat> this past summer, that's when we, you know, we brought you guys into the mix, and um, it's still something. I guess the only reason why they haven't been on the Cut Cafe like they they started to be before was because they still got uh, Ustream issues where we can't pick up the shows anymore. Right. And, uh, you know, that's something on Ustream's half, but yeah. soon that gets rectified. You know, Panic Vision on Tuesdays will be back on the air, as well Radio Smash at 12 on Fridays. So that's what's up. Something to look forward to. True. I, I know some people wonder about that. They've definitely asked, and they thought there was some falling out. But No, no, there was no falling out at all, man. It was all a Ustream issue, and, you know, till this day it pisses me off because, you know, again... Everything starts up. See, see the one thing that I dig about you guys, man, it wasn't about numbers. It was about the love and the dedication to the art craft. That, you know, my, my thing is this. I don't care if you play to five people or 5,000 people. You used to play, you give your all. You make sure you entertain however many people in the room, you know. And sometimes people aren't fortunate to have so many viewers and so forth. But you make the best of it. And, and the thing is, those are the people that I want to surround myself with. I don't give a fuck if a person has... Cotillion friends If you can't bring 30 people in the chat room To watch you rock You know like Then what's the purpose And right. the thing is You know again You guys got a lot of Multimedia shit going on That I really dig You know what I'm saying A lot of people Don't take effort A lot of people Just want to be handed shit You know You fucking buy Serato You're a DJ Right You know what I'm saying You, you get a mic You want to be an M- uh, a rapper Fuck, fuck being an MC Right You know what I'm saying A lot of these things Get overlooked Right, but you know, I I, I, I see I see the heart and what people do and, and uh, the personality and, and 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 the drive and you know, real recognizes real at the end of the day. You know, there's a lot of phony people out there, phony people in the chat room, phony people telling you, yeah, you guys are great, and then when you turn around, like fuck you, right? You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, I, I I've never I felt you know that karma is such a big thing, man. You know, if you want to be a fuck boy and fuck people over, eventually you're gonna get fucked over as well. Right. But if you continue to show, and I've always supported people, you know, people say that I'm disgruntled. No, I'm, I'm far from that. You know, I, I'm glad to be relevant till this day. And if I stop DJing and doing everything tomorrow, I can walk away and know that I've did my best and I know I've left my mark. You know what I'm saying? And But, you know, I appreciate what people like you and PB and, and those guys do to keep this moving forward and know that it'll be in a good place five years from now. You know what I'm saying? Because... Hopefully in five years, I hope I'm not doing this. Right. I hope I'm sitting back enjoying what my son will be doing. Right. Because my son is the next problem. That that he's the next abuser yeah, y'all gotta watch out you. for. He's a turntable abuser. Oh, he he's been doing that for a second, man. Like. Okay, you got him under wraps. Well, not nah, well. It he, not anymore. not anymore. That contract <laughs> with Nickelodeon has been up. You know, and it's just that you know my son, first and foremost, is only 12 years old. So that's always gonna be there. Right. School is the most important thing right now And you know To, to be fortunate to have a, a child Who's interested in school Who does well in school I'm a proud parent of one of those kids You know what I'm saying That's and, what's up You know DJ will always be there I didn't really get my feet wet Until I was 16 So you know He still got a couple of years A-Track didn't win the DMC Until he was 15 So Okay You already well, know I look forward to that Because I, I haven't actually seen him I didn't know it was a question in my mind now I want to get that question answered that I know he jumps on the Hold turntable. On, uh, I'll do this real quick because some people think my son is like the unicorn that they heard about it that he rocks. But um, I'm going to put this on right here. Okay, that's what's up. Yo, put it next to the mic too so they could. Oh, are yeah, you good? No, no, no. You got to come, come do it. Right. <laughs> you ain't getting no more. You ain't getting no more. You get no audio. You well, got to. That, that, that was about as close as that was going to happen. <laughs> and let me tell you something. People want to cut cafes like, yo, Ed, when you let your son rock. Yo. We've been saying that for a hot minute. I was going to break him out. Ted, Ted's been getting on me. Shout out to Ted Smooth, yes. straight face team, straight face and all of that. He's been like, yo, Ed, when you let him come out in the old school jam? Because let me tell you something. My son does vinyl. My okay. son learned on vinyl. He didn't learn on Serato. He wasn't birthed with Serato. Okay. He learned to appreciate the art of the DJ form with vinyl. His, his records, his first two records he put on was How Many MCs. Okay. And J. Ru come clean. Okay. And he started off with a blend that came out on beat, and I knew at that minute that he had it. Okay. And you well, know, he probably have been watching you forever. Well, I mean, he he's always been fascinated. Like I wanted, you know, my any one of my children, my sons, my daughters, whichever one to pick the pick it up. And my oldest son, uh, called Little Eddie, but he never, you know, he's into chicks, so 
You know, he, he was never into the DJing, you know, but, you know, my daughter came after that, and then when my son Elijah came along, he showed an interest from day one, and, hey, you know, he, he's where he's at right now, and, and soon, soon the world will see. Okay, we're looking forward to that. Um, I got one last question for you. Yes, sir. Um, maybe a couple. But where's your vinyl now? Where do you uh, keep your vinyl? I have a lot of it in storage still. Yeah, we uh, have the same problem. I still have over 400,000 records. Wow. And, um, yeah, I've, I've, I'm a serious vinyl collector. I haven't collected vinyl in quite a while. Like, that's too expensive. I go out with, I went out with Kenny Dope a couple of times, 45 shopping, and I'm looking at this dude, and he's picking up 45s that say 200 on it. I'm saying, oh, shit, that's just $2. No, that motherfucking 45 was 200 What? And I'm like, you <laughs> know what? I ain't producing enough records or remixed enough shit to buy a $200 45 and then you so, went to search for it on the internet. Pretty much, and it was records that I had on, on twelve inch or album cuts anyway. So right. it it didn't hold the same weight for me, but I, I still got a vinyl collection out but there. But in storage, so that it doesn't warp, right? Oh yeah, no, nah, it, it, it's it's in a well uh, uh, air conditioned facility. Okay, so yeah. the, the other question I had, which is not related, is uh, what advice would you give to up and coming DJs? Stay true to yourself. Uh, uh, believe in the craft. Understand the craft. Learn the craft. Knowledge for self, you know what I'm saying? It, it, the more knowledgeable that you are about what you're doing and know where it came from, you know, you, in order for you to get to where you're going, you have to know where it came from. And I, I think that's a big problem with a lot of these DJs today. You know, if you tell a DJ that's coming up now to play old school and he's pulling out Biggie and Tupac, that is not old school people, you know what I'm saying? Right. That, you know, that, that that's it's great hip hop, but that's not old school. Old school, you know, you got to learn, you really have to learn it, you know. If you don't know who African Mbada is, if you don't know who Cool Herc is, if you don't know who Grand Woods of Theodore is, if you don't know who Kid Capri is, if you don't know who Red Alert is, if you don't know any of those great individuals who've come before us, who've paved the way, the Disco Wiz, you know what I'm saying, Grandmaster Kaz, if you know Charlie Chase, I mean, the list goes on and on, but if you can't appreciate where those guys came from to lay the foundation for us, then why do it? Right. Because obviously you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Because... Right. Ask a DJ what why does he want to DJ, and pretty much his answer is not anything but to probably get pussy or something, you know, whatever. It's not to to move further the, the art form, you know. There, there is no appreciation for what it is anymore, and I think that that's my 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 beef with a lot of these up and coming DJs. You know, you can be dope, you can crab to death, man. I they I've seen DJs do amazing things, man, that I can't do, never could do. And really never want to do because you know what? I still do what I do. I still do it at, at, at an exceptional rate. And, and the thing is, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't consider myself one of those upper echelon DJs, but I can hold my own. And, you know, and the thing is, at the end of the day, if you straight stay true to the art form and, and show respect for the culture, you will succeed. It, 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 it just, it will happen, you know. It, it might not happen immediately, but you know, if you put in your work and you grind, eventually good things come to those who wait. Okay, that's what's up. All right, so salute, you know what I'm saying, Eddie B. Swift for coming through. We're going to ask you to abuse our turntables one more time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for spending this much time talking to us. I know nah, normally. Man, no doubt, man. We had, we, this had to happen. Eventually it was going to happen. You know what I'm saying? And I'm glad, you know, we was able to do it, man. I, I know today, man. My show was able to hold it down on Rock City Crew TV today. You know, that was like a, a last second thing, man. I just, my mom's actually got, you know, was in the hospital. So kind of like doing the running back and forth over here. But, you know, I had to make sure I came through because you guys have, have shown me nothing but but love up here, man. And, you know, I had to come over here. You know what I'm saying? It, it was not going to, it was not going to happen where I didn't come. Pause. Well, thank Right. <laughs> pause, pause, pause. Um, Eddie, Eddie B. Swift, we can find you on Twitter at Eddie B. Swift. Yes, uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, Eddie B. Swift. Uh, Facebook, you can get me at uh, facebook.com backslash I am Eddie B. Swift. Uh, my website, Eddie B. Swift.com, which basically links it to everything. My telephone number is 347 uh, 91 DJ EBS. Okay. And uh, you already know, man. I mean, you know, people call me up. I, I give out my number on the air. Like, I you know, see, I see. I've had people call me before, man. Like, you know, if I'm available, I'll talk to you. If I can't, you know, it is what it is, man. But uh, salute to everybody, man. Most definitely, I appreciate every single one of y'all. You already know how it goes. Mel says it all the time. Without y'all, they ain't us. You know what I'm saying? And as long as y'all keep supporting us, 
it gives us an opportunity to showcase, you know, what, what we love to do for you guys. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. That's what's up.